Hi everybody. I've had a few requests to work through the solution to number four from our midterm on rotational motion. In problem number four we have two wheels that are identical except their radius um, is different. So F2, or sorry, wheel number two has twice the radius of wheel number one. And the wheels are composed of exactly the same materials. There's eight spokes, each made of some heavy material. So that means that you can't just neglect the mass of the spokes. And also there's a rim that can be modeled as a hollow cylinder. The total mass of the spokes equals the total mass of the rim. So that means adding up all eight of those spokes connected at the center, adding, them, adding their total mass equals the mass of that rim. And wheel number one has a diameter that is half that of wheel number two. The first part asks us to express the moment of inertia of wheel number one in terms of wheel number two. So let's just find a solution for the moment of inertia of wheel one. So as we know, the moment of inertia is going to be the sum of all of the moments of inertia of the whole entire system. So it's going to be the moment of inertia of this hollow cylinder, which is mr squared, and the moment of inertia for each of these individual spokes, their total mass is m, which means that the mass of any one of these little spokes is 1 8 m, because there's eight of them, and it says in here that the wheel is composed of exactly the same uh, materials. The total mass of the spokes equals the total mass of the rim. So each one of these spokes is 1 8 the mass of the entire rim. So here is what the moment of inertia 1 is going to look like. I1 is going to be the moment of inertia of this hollow cylinder of mass m and radius r, m r squared. Look that up on your equation sheet and you'll find that that is the moment of inertia of a hollow cylinder. And then we have eight spokes. And a spoke is a slender rod rotating with an axis around one end. There's eight of them. So the mass of any one of those is going to be um, one eighth of the of the uh, total mass m. So we've got one third m r squared is the moment of inertia for a, the general term for the moment of inertia of a slender rod with an axis um, a rotation axis about one end. So we've got one third. The total mass of one of them is just one eighth, and that's m r squared. Okay, so when you work through the math, what you'll find is that this comes out to be 4 thirds m r squared. Okay, and we're going to do the same thing for i2, except everywhere you see an m here, you're going to put 2m, because each of these spokes is twice as long. This total circumference is twice as big. If you double the radius, you've doubled the circumference. So each one of those, the mass of each spoke here is going to be twice the mass of this. The mass of the rim is going to be twice the mass of this rim. So everywhere you see an m here, you're going to write 2m. And everywhere you see an r, you're going to write 2r. So 2m times 2r squared plus all of this stuff, this actually just came out to 1 third, and then we've got 2m and then 2r squared, and work all that stuff out and it's going to come out to 32 over 3 mr squared. Okay, so if we want to compare i1 in terms of i2, what we're going to do is just divide i1 by i2. So when you do that, i1 divided by i2 is going to equal 4 thirds mr squared divided by 32 mr squared, which is going to come out to 432 or 1 eighth. So that means that the moment of inertia of the big wheel is eight times the moment of inertia of the small wheel. Okay, that's just part one. In part b, we're going to suppose that f1 is equal to f2. We want to express the angular velocity of wheel 1 in terms of wheel 2 after this force has been applied for 5 seconds. So here's where you have to remember a couple of definitions. 
One is that the torque is equal to R cross F, and um, when you have a situation where here is your R and here is F, the sine of the angle between them is 90, and that's equal to 1. So it simplifies down to the torque is equal to just RF. Okay? So if we want to take, um, if we want to compare what happens in these two cases, then we can compare the two equations, one for the first wheel and one for the second wheel. So let me write it like this. So torque 1 equals radius 1 times F1. And if we want to compare these two wheels to each other, this is what we're going to do. And it specifies that F1 is equal to F2, so this equals that. And that means torque 1 compared to torque 2 is going to be 1 half because R1 is half of R2, or R2 is twice R1. Um, but we're not quite there yet. The torque is also equal to I alpha, and we're going to do the same thing here. I1 alpha 1 divided by I2 alpha 2. And I1 over I2, we showed in the previous step, is 1 over 8. So we still don't know what alpha is going to be. And alpha is actually proportional to the angular velocity. So this is the equation that would apply. The delta t is the same in both cases. So let's just write it like this. Um, omega uh, final minus omega initial, which we can say that omega initial is equal to zero, and then this is five seconds. So it's omega final over five seconds, and this is omega final one, and omega final two divided by five seconds, and you can see the fives go away. So what we've got in the end is that one half is equal to one eighth omega final one over omega final two. And so that means the ratio of omega one to omega two is going to be equal to four. And this would be true regardless of whether your initial angular velocity was equal to zero or not. Okay, so for the last one, we're going to do a similar process. And now we don't know the forces, but the net torque on each wheel is the same. So let's just work through the same algebra here. We've got torque is equal to R cross F, which reduces down to RF. So torque 1 divided by torque 2 is going to equal R1 divided by R2 times F1 divided by F2. And here, the torques are the same. The net torque on each wheel is the same. That means this equals this equals 1. And um, the torques are equal to I alpha. So we've got I1 alpha 1, I2 alpha 2. And we know that R1 divided by R2 is 1 over 2. And the forces are unknown. Um, I1 over I2 is 1 over 8, and alpha 1 over alpha 2, that's going to be our omega 1 divided by omega 2. Okay, so when you do all this out, you get um, omega 1 over omega 2 equals 8. And that was a different result than we got in the step before. So when the forces are unknown but the torques are the same, you get a ratio of your angular velocities where omega 1 is 8 times omega 2, so it's spinning 8 times faster if the torques are the same. Um, if you have the same forces on here, so if these two forces are the same, 
then this wheel is spinning only four times as fast as this one. So work through the algebra yourself, get familiar with this process of um, comparing equations rather than just plugging numbers into them. Because a lot of times we don't care what the actual number is, we just care what happens when you double the force, what happens when you double the moment of inertia, what happens when you double the, the radius. That's really what's important. Does the um, do things go up by a factor of four? Do they go down by a factor of two? That's kind of what we want to get a feel for and, and worry a little bit less about the exact numbers that all of these things come out to be.